Hello guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. From this video, I'm going to discuss about the inguinal canal. So here, I will discuss about the anatomy of inguinal canal, including its extent, surface marking, then the wall of the inguinal canal, that means boundaries, contents, as well as what is the clinical correlation of the inguinal canal. So let's get going. So, uh, when we talk about the inguinal canal, it is about 4 cm long intramuscular passage in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall. And it is located just above the medial half of the inguinal ligament. You can see the inguinal ligament extend f extending from anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. And here, just above the medial half of the inguinal ligament, you can see the passage, intramuscular passage, which is known as the inguinal canal. It begins at the deep inguinal ring in the transversalis fascia. Here is the deep inguinal ring and courses in the anterior, inferior and medial direction. Anterior, inferior and medial direction in this direction. Uh, to end at the super, superficial inguinal ring in the external oblique aponeurosis. Here is the superficial inguinal ring in the external oblique aponeurosis. Therefore, its lateral end is deep inguinal ring and the medial end is superficial inguinal ring. When we talk about the surface marking, inguinal canal is marked by drawing two parallel lines. Here also you can see the two parallel lines. Drawing two parallel lines uh, just above the medial half of the inguinal ligament. The deep ring is drawn at the lateral end of these two lines, one centimeter above the mid inguinal point. This is the mid inguinal point. And 1 cm above the mid-inguinal point is the deep inguinal ring. The superficial inguinal ring is drawn at the medial end of the parallel lines just above the pubic tubercle. This is situated just above the pubic tubercle. I think this will be more clear for you. Here is the inguinal canal. Here is the transversalis fascia. You can see this is the um, the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. Then here, this is the internal oblique muscle. Here, the transversalis abdominis, transversus abdominis. Here, the uh, aponeurosis of the external oblique. Here, the internal oblique. Here, the transversus abdominis. Here, the transversalis fascia. You can see here the transversalis fascia. So, in, the, in this transversalis fascia, there is the deep inguinal ring. In the external oblique aponeurosis, you can see the superficial inguinal ring. So, the inguinal canal extends from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. Let's see what are the boundaries of the inguinal canal or the walls of the inguinal canal. It is easier to remember like that, like this diagram. This intramuscular passage is like this diagram. This is the roof of the in inguinal uh, canal and you can see the floor of the inguinal canal. Then here the anterior wall and the posterior wall. Here is the superficial inguinal ring. You can see here is the deep inguinal ring. So deep inguinal ring is in the posterior wall and and the superficial inguinal ring is in the anterior wall. Here is the medial aspect and here is the lateral aspect. First, I will show you what is the what are the structures which forms the flow of the inguinal canal. So, here is the flow of the inguinal canal. In the flow, the medial end is formed by the lacunar ligament. The medial end is formed by the lacuna ligament. Rest of the flow. Rest of the flow is formed by the grooved upper surface of the medial half of the inguinal ligament. This is the inguinal ligament.
Here, this is the inguinal ligament and the upper surface of the inguinal ligament forms the floor of the inguinal canal. Then here, the anterior abdomen, anterior inguinal wall. From this diagram, I will show you the anterior wall. The anterior wall consists of superficial to deep, the skin, then the superficial fascia, then the external oblique aponeurosis in the entire extent of the inguinal entire extent. Here, this is the, the green color one is the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle. And, uh, and also, it is formed by the inguinal fibers of internal oblique muscle in the lateral end. Here is the lateral end you can see the inguinal fibers of the internal oblique muscle. In the anterior inguinal wall, uh, if we take it as two layers, first the uh, skin and the superficial fascia, then the wall of the, then the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle is in the entire extent of the inguinal canal. And uh, the lateral end, lateral end, a small area is formed by the fleshy fibers of the internal oblique muscle as well. Like this. This is the anterior wall of the inguinal canal. Hope you are clear with that. Then the roof of the inguinal canal is formed by arched fibers of the internal oblique muscle. Above the internal oblique, the inguinal fibers of transversus abdomen is also arch over the roof of the canal. The ilioinguinal nerve enters the canal by piercing the arched fibers of the internal oblique muscle. You can see the internal oblique muscle here. So, from these arched fibers of the internal oblique muscle, the roof of the inguinal canal is formed. You can see the ilioinguinal nerve is also coming from the uh, roof of the inguinal canal towards the inguinal canal by piercing the arched fibers of the internal oblique muscle. Then the posterior wall of the inguinal canal, it consists of transversalis fascia in the entire extent. But the conjoint tendon is also contributes to uh, form a small part of the medial aspect of the posterior wall. Here you can see the transversalis fascia and conjoint tendon in the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. So let's summarize the boundaries of the inguinal canal. Uh, first, the roof is formed by the arch fibers of the internal oblique muscle as well as the transversus abdominis muscle. There is the uh, ilioinguinal nerve coming towards the canal by piercing the internal oblique muscle fibers. Then the flow. Flow is formed by the medial aspect. There is lacunal ligament and then the upper, upper surface of the inguinal ligament in the lateral aspect. Then the posterior wall, in the medial aspect, the conjoint tendon is there. And then in the lateral aspect, the entire canal is um, formed by the transversalis fascia. Then the anterior inguinal canal, the first there is a skin and superficial fascia. Then uh, internally, there is external oblique aponeurosis in the medial aspect and in lateral one third internal oblique muscle fibers. Now you know deep inguinal ring is located in the is a deficiency in the posterior wall or the transversalis fascia and the superficial inguinal ring in is the deficiency in the anterior inguinal wall. Then there is an important structure called Hessel important area called Hesselbach triangle. This triangle is bounded laterally by inferior epigastric artery and uh, medially by the lateral margin of the 
rectus abdominis muscle and inferiorly by the medial part of the inguinal ligament. This is the Hasselbach triangle or the inguinal triangle. Laterally, there is inferior epigastric artery, then medially lateral margin of the rectus abdominis muscle and inferiorly medial part of the inguinal ligament. The importance is the triangle is divided into lateral and medial parts by the ligamentous remnant, remnants of the obliterated umbilical artery. The hernia protruding through its medial part is called as medial direct hernia and the one protruding through its lateral part is called as lateral direct hernia. Don't confuse with the indirect hernia. It is not the indirect hernia. This the hernia protruding through this canal, this uh, Hesselbach triangle is direct hernia. That direct hernia is divided as medial and lateral. Let's see what are the contents of the inguinal canal in a male. The spermatic cord and ileoinguinal nerve are the main contents in a male. Spermatic cord consists of, this is the spermatic cord and it consists of the uh, vas deferens. Uh, the testicular artery, pampiniform plexus, you can see the blue color one is the pampiniform plexus of veins, artery to ductus difference, cremasteric artery, fibrous remnants of the processus vaginalis and lymphatics as well as the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve and autonomic nerve plexuses. Some of those structures you can see in this diagram, the ductus difference. Then there is the parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis. Then uh, cremasteric muscle. Uh, from it is for, cremasteric muscle is from, formed from the internal oblique muscle. Then the testicular artery and pampiniform plexus of veins, and genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. Those are some structures in the, in a male. In a female, there is round ligament of uterus. You can see. The round ligament of uterus in the inguinal canal as well as the ileoinguinal nerve. I want to tell you another important relation. Here, uh, this is the deep inguinal ring. You can see the deep inguinal ring, and inferior epigastric artery is a medial relation to the deep inguinal ring. Remember that. Next, uh, let's talk about the clinical correlation. With uh, regarding uh, regards to this in inguinal canal, uh, inguinal canal. Uh, when we talk about the inguinal canal, it is important to know that inguinal hernias. A hernia is a protrusion of the peritoneal sac with or without a contained viscous through any weakness in the abdominal wall. Uh, simply, inguinal hernia is a protrusion of the peritoneal sac. The inguinal canal is a common site of herniation uh, since its wall is a uh, weakness. Uh, since uh, there is a weakness in the anterior abdominal wall. Hernia is in inguinal canal is known as inguinal hernia. And there are two types of inguinal hernias as indirect inguinal hernias and direct inguinal hernias. You have to know how to compare those two types of hernias. It is important to know uh, when you write the answers in for your questions as well. Actually, uh, the inguinal hernia usually present as a swelling in the inguinal region or the groin. The swelling usually increases in size on coughing. It is possible to reduce the hernia manually by pushing it upward or the hernia swelling may disappear automatically in the supine position. In this picture, uh, this is you, your left sided, uh, the indirect hernia, inguinal hernia is there, then uh, right side, the direct inguinal hernia is there. I will tell you the how to compare these two types of hernias. Uh, when we talk about the indirect inguinal hernia, it is more common in children and young uh, young age boys and uh, the hernia usually enters enters the inguinal canal via the deep inguinal ring. 
in indirect inguinal hernia the hernial sac enters to the canal via deep inguinal ring and then passes through the entire inguinal canal uh, to come out through the superficial inguinal ring it is inside the covering of spermatic cord and can enters into the scrotum as well the neck of the hernial sac usually lateral to the inferior epigastric artery you can see the neck of the hernial sac here is the neck of the hernial sac so the neck of the hernial sac is lateral to the inferior epigastric artery you have to remember that point thoroughly this is the direct inguinal hernia and it is more common in old age the predisposing factor in old age is weakness in the abdominal muscles for direct inguinal hernia and there are various factors which are responsible for weakening of the anterior abdominal wall muscles uh, including rising intraabdominal pressure chronic constipation then chronic cough lifting heavy weights those reasons can increase the intraabdominal pressure and weakening the anterior abdominal wall muscles so uh, in direct inguinal hernia the hernia hernia enters in enters to the canal through hasselbach triangle uh, and hernia comes out via superficial inguinal ring and it lies outside the spermatic cord i told you in indirect inguinal hernia can lie inside the can enter the um, scrotum because it is inside the coverings of the spermatic cord but the direct inguinal hernia is in outside of the spermatic cord and indirect one enters to the canal via deep inguinal ring and direct inguinal hernia comes out via superficial inguinal ring and in direct inguinal hernia the neck of the hernial sac is medial to the inferior epigastric artery it is also very important uh, the neck of the hernial sac is medial to the inferior epigastric artery so uh, hope you understand uh, clearly about the differences between the indirect inguinal hernia and the direct inguinal hernia so that's all about the inguinal canal and its clinical correlations so if you like this video put a like and a comment in the comment section thank you for watching